Chain reactions is a triple, quadruple pun, which I don't expect anybody to get. I must say, though, that everybody was very impressed with Vice President Gorse knowing about Turing tests. I was impressed that he knew what the amygdala did. So it's just, it's all a question of your perspective. And he got it right, and, you know, very, an impressive guy in all, in many respects. Uh, so advanced information technology and networking has created my field. I do biomedical informatics, uh, and I was hired on the faculty in 1992 where there was no word like that. And so they said, we want you to work at the intersection of computers and medicine. And basically, they could have said biomedical informatics, except the word didn't exist. Uh, and it's because of, um, I feel extremely um, privileged to be working at the nexus of the networking information uh, uh, Te technology revolution and the biomedical revolution, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But in our, in my world, we're using advanced information technology to try to organize a tsunami of data. It starts with DNA, and I'll talk about DNA sequence in the genome. DNA is is your genome. It's in your every one of your cells has six billion DNA uh, bases that encode you. Uh, six billion used to be a lot, uh, but as I'll show you, it now easily fits on my iPhone. Uh, we also have molecular data. Uh, we have very, very clever biologists who every day spend all day figuring out how to miniaturize and uh, speed up the measurement of information about what molecules are doing, what cells are doing, what organs are doing. And then a different group takes over, but then all of a sudden now we also have people figuring out how do we measure humans. You heard about remote sensing and not remote sensing. But in, in medicine, we are looking at a world where we're going to know a lot of things about a patient in real time, not only what's going in their physiology, but also what's going on in their head, at least by virtue of what they're typing into their smartphone, into their Google search log, their Bing search log, whatever. And then, of course, people are watching. And so we have a, amazing now stores of public health information that are collected in the kind of top-down way by the Center for Disease Control, NIH, and many others, but there's also this really powerful emerging source of population data from the patients, I, I think of them as patients, from people themselves. And I'll, and I'll touch upon that uh, very briefly as well. So as I said, my field exists because of this IT explosion. Uh, core to me is the NIH support and investment in informatics. Uh, I started teaching a course called Representation and Algorithms for Molecular Biology in 1994. That course continues to be taught every year, now online, in, a, in addition to other things. Although I don't have 160,000 uh, students yet, uh, I've been watching Sebastian, and I will figure out how to do that. In 1994, a Stanford graduate student named Sergey Brin sat in on my class, and uh, evidently biology wasn't interesting enough. He didn't take it for a grade, uh, but we've talked about it subsequently. When, when I met him, he said, yeah, that was kind of neat. Um, <laughs> I want to I I stress that the, you think of NIH, but um, DOE actually had very important early leadership in the Human Genome Project and uh, concomitantly in the funding of the informatics technologies that w by necessity come with the human genome. NSF, we've heard about uh, this morning, and I want to say that they also their biological database activities, their supercomputer centers also uh, contributed as well as, and this is just a very short a list, to be very honest, of companies that have actually given me money. So this is just an example, not at all in any sense exhaustive. So the interesting situation we find ourselves in in biology right now is that our ability to generate DNA sequence data has actually outpaced Moore's Law for five or six years. And I don't know if any of you have been in a field that has outpaced Moore's Law. I didn't realize I was in one, uh, but it is extremely stressful because <laughs> When everything is okay, the algorithms that we uh, invented five years ago work perfectly fine now because Moore's Law has been carrying them along, and as the data collection increased, as long as it was within range, the algorithms were perfectly uh, able to handle things. Well, when your data is outpacing Moore's Law, all of a sudden the emperor has no clothes. Your algorithms look really stupid and slow and unusable. Your hardware... Uh, hard, your hard drives, your, your data storage capabilities look totally inadequate. Uh, and the network adequacy appears very unclear. And for a brief period of time, the fastest way to trade around genomes was to FedEx the hard drive. 
And that, that is not a crowning achievement, right, of the national information infrastructure. And, and we've, we've kind of made up that gap. But for a while there, and the other thing I should say is when, when your data is outpacing Moore's Law, every, the next day is worse. Tomorrow is worse than yesterday, obviously. So th all of these things, I'm, this is not a gray picture. This is exciting, and we are on, back on top of things in many ways, mostly due to algorithmic cleverness. Uh, but the, the opportunities for innovation are very clear. This is, uh, that's my laptop at home, and that is a two terabyte uh, hardware encrypted hard drive that has my genome on it. Stanford Department of Genetics decided it would be a good idea to sequence the genomes of the entire faculty who wanted to do it. I did want to do it. My work is in using the genome to predict drug response. Um, uh, it, it was free. Uh, it cost the department about, it was free, free for me. It, was, it cost the department about $3,000 a pop. This is for all six billion bases. So you've heard about companies like 23andMe. They're measuring about a million key locations in the genome, but they're not measuring all six billion locations. That has all six billion locations. Uh, and it's been sitting on my desk for a week because I'm too busy to actually take a look at it. Um, and, but th that's where we are in terms of the ability to measure DNA sequence. So I'm just going to tell s five uh, short stories. I'm going to talk about the biomedical literature and its availability today, which is transformative. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this large store of DNA data and other structural data we have. I'll talk about high precision simulation, imaging data, and then crowdsourced health data. So one of the big, uh, and so you can think of health and biology as an application area of the, of the basic technologies that we've been talking about today. Uh, many of you have heard of PubMed. Basically, every published biomedical article um, for the last, since 1966, is available online with a copyright waived abstract, uh, now to the tune of about 22 million abstracts, which do a number of things. They give biologists routine access to the medical literature, but they also are an amazing playground for people like me who want to use text processing technologies. We heard a little bit about them earlier this morning to try to understand what this is telling us. And work that I won't be able to describe, we've been able to predict drug-drug interactions by looking at dis disparate publications that give you all the logical pieces you need to infer that drug A will interact with drug B. It just never says that in a single abstract. And you have to do what really turns out to be very basic inference to, in to figure that out. And so you, these are just numbers that show about 100 million web uh, views per month at PubMed, brought to you by the National Center for Biotechnology Information uh, on Lister Hill at the National Library of Medicine. This is just the beginning of that curve for DNA sequencing. That ends in 2009 or so, uh, and it has just taken off. This is really the cost, the curve I wanted to show you, which shows you that up until about uh, the year 2000 and, well, I can't read my, the, the slide. But you can see where the cost of DNA sequencing started dropping faster than the cost of transistors. And that created the stress that I was talking about, uh, which creates, though, a very exciting time for all of us in terms of figuring out what to do with this and, and how to get on top of it. This is a, a simulation. One of the major contributions of the supercomputer centers were providing enough raw computing power so that the physics of how molecules fold and interact could be simulated. This is from my colleague Vijay Pandey at Stanford. And it is a small protein that is spontaneously folding from a random starting point into its eventual three-dimensional structure uh, before your eyes. And those are five or six of the key um, amino acids that are creating physical interactions that matter. This is work by another colleague at Stanford, Charlie Taylor, who's taken uh, CT data. CT data is very vol voluminous because it is very precise and now cut on cuts that are very closely spaced submillimeter, Charlie creates three-dimensional models of something like the descending aorta and then simulates blood th flow through them using, um, obviously, fluid dynamics. In this case, what you're seeing is an abdominal aortic aneurysm from a patient where before surgery, Charlie and the surgeons are able to figure out what the best anastomoses, what the best bypasses would be to optimize the downstream flow of blood to the legs of this patient. This is happening today. Finally, crowdsourcing. You've all heard about this very exciting uh, uh, work. Uh, Google and some investigators, uh, uh, Australia and other places, looked at the Google search logs for flu-type words, flu-like symptoms, and were able to detect flu outbreaks before the uh, 
people, not only before they were recognized by the public health department, but before the uh, vendors of over-the-counter medications and fluids uh, even saw an uptick in their sales, which is one of the other sources of information about um, these uh, outbreaks. So it's clear that the patients are telling us, if we listen, what's going on. They're telling us about outbreaks in work that we've done. Uh, and in fact, this is an interesting story. We, um, through traditional data mining techniques, we had found an interaction between two drugs that increased glucose. Um, I saw my friend Eric Horvitz, who you'll hear later on today, uh, at a meeting, and I said, hey, Eric, we did this cool thing. I would love to see if patients were doing searches. So to make a long story short, Paxil and Pravacol, which we predicted to be associated with high glucose and perhaps diabetes symptoms, had a three times higher rate of being searched in, actually this was in Bing search logs, than either drug alone with, along with diabetes type words. That is to say, people were typing in the two drugs and then other words that are associated with diabetes, like hyperglycemia and, and a long list of other words, at about three times the rate as if they just typed in one drug or the other. We took this as evidence that, again, the patients were telling us that these two drugs were increasing their glucose. And so you can imagine the excitement we have about how do we make this a routine surveillance for post-release um, pharmacovigilance. And then you've already heard today about patients like me, which is a gathering place for patients to talk about their experiences of disease. I have no financial connection with patients like me, but it's a, a really interesting idea that patients will not only share with each other, but with a growing database, their symptoms, their, their dynamic time course of their disease, as well as um, their response to drugs, which is of particular interest to me. So two data trends that I think are obvious, but I want to underscore in the context of this meeting, is that our ability to make basic measurements of the genome, of metabolites, proteins, uh, is getting much better. These devices are getting smaller, they're getting cheaper, and they're getting more accurate. I totally agree with the comment this morning that it's all about measurements. Advancements in science are all about measurements, and our, our ability to measure physical things is being matched by our ability to store and analyze that data. On the other end, the healthcare system is increasingly instrumented with electronic medical records that are capturing individual patient physiology. When you add to that the sensors and the patients telling us what they're interested in through their searches, through their smartphones, I think the future is very bright for linking those two sources of data to really transform health. So the challenges are pretty obvious, I think. It's to measure, store, and integrate this data ranging from the molecular all the way up to the organismal and even population level. And then, of course, the fun part is discovering the patterns that will allow us to improve diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment, which really will be uh, personalized medicine in a very real sense. So this is just kind of my final slide, which just is this in, in pictures, this incredible network of data ranging from molecular data, that's a, mole a protein molecule in the upper left, all the way to population data, uh, data from the literature, data from uh, public health, and, and from crowdsourcing. So I'll end this just with one brief plug, which is that one of my uh, grants creates a magazine, the Biomedical Computation Review. We try to make it like the MIT Technology Review, but all about computation in biomedicine. It's printed as well as online, and we'd be happy to send a hard copy for free to anybody who just sends, signs up on the website. Uh, and other than that, I'll thank you, and uh, if there's time for questions. We do have time for a quick question for Russ, if anybody has one. Testing. I'm on, I'm on, I'm on the air. Any questions for Russ? What, what has been your favorite part of the last year? Is it getting your genome and not having the chance to look at it yet? <laughs> <laughs> we have had a lot of success taking in other people's genomes and looking at their enti the entire set of health consequences for their health. This is in published work. We did first my colleague Steve Quake sequenced his genome, and we told him about his disease risk, uh, his, the risks for rare diseases in his children or grandchildren, and his drug response. We then went on to do uh, a quartet, mom, dad, child, son, daughter, and that was also a lot of fun. So that really kind of drove home for me and for others that we really can start to use the genome uh, in healthcare, I, I think in all of our lifetimes. And I'm going to risk a little bit of delay and just take one, one question from the audience there. Thanks. Hi. hi. 
Okay. Hi. Uh, nice to see you. Sure. Great presentation. I was wondering, um, didn't see anything about behavior. And one of the issues that we have with the genome is to connect it with this other huge data, uh, huge big data having to do with behavior. Absolutely. So I, I meant for the crowdsource stuff to be about behavior because really what I meant when I talked about Google and Bing searches is that the, there is a behavioral and we actually have now ways to assay it. Right? In, in many, for many years the problem was how do you ever get at that? So the, uh, the two words I'll leave for behavior because I'm very bullish on it is crowdsource data as a source of information about behavior and the other thing is the immunological record. You have this amazing immune system which responds whenever you're exposed to something. There is now beginning to be progress at um, mining your immunological record to find out everything that you've ever been exposed to uh, that your body reacted to. And I, this is a fledgling field, but I think very exciting. Great. Thank you, Russ.